Unit 4, Lesson 18. How did the people approve the new Constitution? Before the Constitution's ratification. Here's where the political leaders of the colonies. They had developed their own ideas about what might be the best kind of government. The founders learned about government from reading history and philosophy and from their own experience of self-government as colonists within the British Empire. They were as familiar with ancient Greece and Rome as they were with later European history. The founders led the fight to free the American colonies from British rule. They helped create the state governments, and their ideas influenced the writing of the Constitution. The founders included such people as John and Abigail Adams, Benjamin Franklin, Patrick Henry, Thomas Jefferson, Mercy Otis Warren, and George Washington. The framers are the people who wrote the Constitution. They were prominent statesmen such as Washington and Franklin, James Madison, Governor Morris, George Mason, and Alexander Hamilton. Historian Max Farrand wrote this about the framers of the Constitution. Great men there were, it is true, but the convention as a whole was composed of men such as would be appointed to a similar gathering at the present time, professional men, businessmen, and gentlemen of leisure, patriotic statesmen and clever, scheming politicians, some trained by experience and study for the task before them, and others utterly unfit. It was essentially a representative body. Federalists versus Anti-Federalist Federalists were for the Constitution and the Antis were against. The Federalists said, hey, the Articles of Confederation was so messed up that we needed to get rid of it and write a new plan for government, while the anti said, no, let's just fix the original version. The Federalists were in favor of this concept that we discussed before known as federalism, in which power would be shared between a strong central government and the state governments, whereas the antis wanted the state governments to hold almost all of the power and to have a very weak national government. Again, the Federalists wanted a large central government and the Antis wanted a small one. And this last line tells us who was likely to be a Federalist, and that was the wealthy merchants. And the Antis were usually small, not poor, but less rich farmers. Again, these are overviews, and there was plenty of people who didn't fit into the stereotypes, but that's basically who your everyday Federalists and Anti-Federalists were. How did James Madison plan to get the people to approve the new Constitution? James Madison's plan to get the people to approve the Constitution was by going to states and holding special conventions so that the people could vote themselves. Derivative 51. Over the past several years, substantial power has been granted to the president and the executive branch. One such example of extreme power is National Security Presidential Directive 51, which was created by President George W. Bush in May of 2007. Directive 51 says that when the president considers an emergency to have occurred, an enduring constitutional government comprising a cooperative effort among the executive, legislative, and judicial branches of the federal government, coordinated by the president, will take the place of the nation's regular government. The goal of Directive 51 is to ensure the continuity of federal government in the case of an emergency. They define these emergencies as any incident, regardless of location, that results in extraordinary levels of mass casualties, damage, or disruption severely affecting the U.S. population, infrastructure, environment, economy, or government functions. This policy would also create a new national continuity coordinator inside the White House. They would be charged with ensuring all executive agencies have a plan to keep functioning if their leadership becomes unable to fulfill their duties. To put it simply, if an emergency happens anywhere in the world that could negatively impact the U.S., the president would be able to implement a new government to replace our existing one and grant themselves extreme executive authority. Before Directive 51, it would have been up to FEMA to handle these situations, but this power has now been handed over to the White House. Worst of all, Directive 51 does not specify what the legal limits of this power will be, and not even Congress has been allowed to challenge it. The United States was founded with a system of checks and balances in place within the federal government. No one branch was to be more powerful than the other. But as time goes on, more and more authority is being granted to the executive branch. It would seem that our checks and balances are not working, and we're coming to the point where we have to say, it's time to draw the line.
Federalist and Anti-Federalist, Ratifying the Constitution. September of 1787, the Constitution was complete and ready for ratification. Almost. Ratification means to make something official by signing it or voting for it. And to ratify the Constitution and make it the supreme law of the land, nine of the 13 states had to approve of it. In the end, it took more than a year and a half to get 11 states to ratify and nearly two and a half years to get all 13 to ratify. During this time, two opposing groups emerged, the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. The Federalists were in favor of ratification. They felt the Constitution was already complete as it was, and were in favor of a strong central or national government to keep the country running smoothly. The Federalists were mostly wealthy businessmen living in large trading cities along the coast. They included the Founding Fathers, Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, James Madison, and John Marshall. They explained how the Constitution would work by publishing a series of newspaper articles known as the Federalist Papers under the false name Publius. The Anti-Federalists were against ratification of the Constitution. They feared a strong central government would be too much like a king and wanted a Bill of Rights to be added to the Constitution that would guarantee people the freedoms they had fought so hard for in the Revolution. They were less organized than the Federalists and consisted of common people living in both the cities and the countryside. Some of the better-known Anti-Federalists include John Adams, Samuel Adams, George Clinton, and Patrick Henry. At this time, only Delaware, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Georgia, and Connecticut had voted in favor, giving the Constitution only five of the nine states needed to ratify. The Federalists realized that to get the other states to ratify, they were going to have to add a Bill of Rights. After promising the addition of a Bill of Rights, Massachusetts, Maryland, South Carolina, and New Hampshire cast their votes. With nine out of 13 states on board, the Constitution wasn't ratified for the entire country, but did go into effect in those nine states. At this point, the two biggest and most economically important states had yet to ratify, Virginia and New York. George Washington, Edmund Randolph, and James Madison worked hard to convince Virginia to ratify, while Alexander Hamilton set his sights on New York. A few months later, in the summer of 1788, Virginia and New York officially voted to ratify the Constitution, bringing the count to 11. Though North Carolina and Rhode Island eventually came around, with 11 out of 13 states, the Constitution was ratified and became the supreme law of the land. Arguments for the Constitution Arguments for the Constitution once the Constitution was created, it was sent out to the states to be ratified or approved. And when it was set out, both sides argued for and against the Constitution. Federalists were supporters of the Constitution. They believed it offered a fair balance of power. They thought the Constitution offered a careful compromise on key political issues. If you remember, we learned about the Great Compromise and the Three-Fifths Compromise last week. And those were just two of a handful of compromises made in order to settle those regional differences. Some of the Federalists included James Madison, George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, John Jay, and Alexander Hamilton. Federal Federalists tended to be wealthy farmers, lawyers, and landowners. Arguments against the Constitution. Arguments against the Constitution. There were Federalists that were for the Constitution. Anti-Federalists were against the Constitution. They opposed the Constitution and they did not want a new government. They wanted to stay with the Articles of Confederation because they thought the Constitution gave too much power to the central government. They wanted protection for individual rights. At this point, the Constitution, when it was sent out for ratification, had no Bill of Rights. Those first 10 amendments that the United States is so proud of were not a part of the Constitution that was set out to be ratified. So anti-federalists were really afraid that if they created this central government that was so powerful over the states without individual rights being protected, that all the rights and freedoms they had fought for and stood up for would be destroyed. Um, some anti-federalists included Patrick Henry, Samuel Adams, and George Mason, and many anti-federalists were small farmers and debtors. The major debate of the Constitution all right, in 1787, delegates to the Philadelphia Convention agreed to write a constitution that would strengthen the national government. 
They quickly realized, however, that much of the agreement ended there. First major debate was about how many representatives each state would send to Congress. The second major debate involved the question of slavery and how the new Constitution would address this contentious issue. Let's take a closer look at how the framers compromised on each of these issues. Okay, the first plan that was proposed at the convention was the Virginia plan. In the, in the Virginia plan, they basically said we need two chambers uh, in the legislative branch, and the number of votes for each of these chambers are going to be based on state population. Naturally, the larger states wanted this because this would give them much more power in the new Constitution. And what made this more important was that the legislative branch, as they were designing this at first particularly, was going to be the most powerful branch. Uh, so the large states were definitely supporters of the Virginia plan. Smaller states were beginning to feel like they might be overpowered, came up with the New Jersey plan. The idea here, similar to the Articles of Confederation, where the legislative branch just had one chamber, just a Congress, basically. Each state would get one vote that would be equal across the board. And this way, the smaller states uh, would have more power. If you also remember the activity we did comparing state populations and the votes that each state would get, uh, you can see where the Virginia plan wanted uh, the large states to have that type of system, and the New Jersey plan really favored the smaller states with, with equal representation. This was just the fight over power. Correct. Like who could have more power in the Congress? So the Great Compromise, this is what they decided on. And actually, I believe it was the Connecticut delegate. Yes, Connecticut it was. Connecticut Compromise. Connecticut Compromise. Uh, Connecticut represent. <laughs> Congress is divided into two houses, the Senate, two per state, and the House of Reps based on population. This way, the small states would favor the Senate because they got more power in that, and then the large states would favor the House because they would have better proportional representation in that chamber. Slavery was the second issue that the framers had to deal with at the Constitutional Convention. Um, many delegates did oppose slavery, however, uh, especially states from the North knew that if slavery was not compromised on, then the Southern delegates would walk out. Uh, the Southern states would leave, the Constitution would not be written. So compromises had to be made on this issue. Um, let's see how some of those compromises came about. Okay, the first thing they decided to compromise was the slave trade. Uh, basically, they said to the South, look, we're to help you get into the position to sign this Constitution, we'll say that we won't stop the slave trade until at least 1808. Now, this didn't mean that slavery would be abolished in 1808, it just meant that the slave trade would Correct. be abolished. Correct, and secondly, slaves that escaped to other states had to be returned. Uh, we call this the Fugitive Slave Clause, and essentially, remember, slaves were property. So if, uh, if slave owners' property uh, were to escape to another state, that would have to be brought back. Uh, and so that was built into the Constitution. Okay, and probably the most contentious debate uh, or compromise of all of these were the three-fifths clause. And what that said is that southern states were going to be given extra representation in Congress based on their slave pop uh, population. Now, they wouldn't count all of them, but for every five sl uh, slaves in the south, three of them would count towards the state's population in the House of Representatives. Now, how did that help the south? Well, think of it this way. The House of Representatives is based on population. If you can count slaves as part of your population, that's going to give you more votes. So the great irony in this, or the hypocrisy in this, is that the South wanted to count slaves as part of the population for representation purposes, but in reality, they had absolutely zero interest in, in any kind of political rights or anything like that uh, for slaves. Again, they were considered property. Uh, not even considered people at the time. Yeah, one, one common misconception there is I've had students in the past think that three out of every five slaves could vote. That is not the case. Nope. They had no None voting rights. None. Um, one uh, negative, though, for the South out of this is they had to pay more direct taxes. Okay, so those slaves that would count towards representation, the North said, look, you can count them for representation, but you're going to have to pay taxes as if those people were a part of the full population. So the result of this was that the southern states agreed to support the Constitution. However, we can see in the text of the Constitution that the framers weren't necessarily on board with this idea. Yeah, keep in mind if you were to look in the Constitution, the word slave uh, never appears. Uh, the language is described in, in a way other persons or importation of such persons, but the word slaves doesn't appear in there. And we discussed that in class really for uh, the idea that if we're putting this out to the world, to the rest of the country, um, it's kind of a way to bury the issue uh, and just use other language to describe it. Mm -hmm.